Chapter 2 The Reluctant Mistress Learning to Love Command How shall I rule over others that hath not full power and command of myself? Francois Rabelais Despite the catalogue of pleasures of female domination given in Chapter 1, you have turned to this chapter. Therefore I deduce that you are suffering some conflict over your role as mistress. You may feel guilty or ashamed about your fantasies of dominating men, or you may be in love with a man who has submissive fantasies and wants you to act them out with him. He probably gave this book to you unless, in a valiant effort to learn, you purchased it for yourself. And you, wishing to please him, but unwilling or unable to rule him, feel lonely, confused, unhappy, repelled, or utterly inadequate. Possibly you yourself are a submissive in despair at the thought of ever assuming authority. Is it possible for you to learn to love command? Can you become a happy, effective, and satisfied mistress? Yes. Not every female tyrant started life with fantasies of punishing and controlling helpless males. Many learned first how to go through the motions of dominance play and only later came to enjoy the experience. Not only will this book teach you to how to become a mistress, but also how to have fun doing so. It is scarcely my intention to oppress women with yet another duty owed to males. If, after listening to my suggestions and giving the fantasy a reasonable trial, you find that you do not enjoy female domination, don't do it. If your male still insists, dump him. No one has the right to force you into sexual acts that make you feel uncomfortable. However, you do owe yourself a chance to try to understand and enjoy this new realm of experience. You may find you enjoy it very much indeed. If you have long-standing fears or conflicts over sexual issues, do yourself the greatest possible kindness and see a therapist. The process may be painful, but given a deep, decent therapist and your own willingness to work, it can change your life. The Repressed Dominatrix is it possible to become a dom and not know it? Absolutely. That's why it's always worth trying. Remember, if you hate it, you don't have to keep doing it. I've known several wonderful doms who managed to go through 20, 30, 40 years without noticing their own deep need for sexual control. Then something changed. A friend suggested it to them, or they heard or read a story that unleashed their needs. Then all the repressed domliness flowed back into their lives, energizing them sexually and giving them new depth and pleasure to their relationships. Because our families and society don't offer much support or many positive role models for women who need sexual control, it can be easy for us to pack away our dangerous desires until it's safe to bring them into the light. For years after I became an active dom, I kept stumbling into memories of old fantasies and old activities that now, in hindsight, seemed unmistakably dom. The hours and hours I spent on the phone with my best friend when we were 14, planning to kidnap a male friend of ours, were a definite clue. The elaborate and dark kidnapping fantasies I had then had been totally repressed and forgotten until a friend asked me for suggestions on doing a consensual kidnapping scene. I'd also forgotten the dungeon fantasies I had dating from my earliest years in school. The games I played with my first lover, making him sit up and beg, roll over, even bark, were so domly that I laughed out loud when I remembered them. I was 16 then, but I had completely forgotten doing it. Being a dom wasn't emotionally safe for me then, so I saved it for the time when I was strong enough to do it right. The Guilty Dominatrix Perhaps you haven't repressed your needs. All your life, you have fantasized about dominating a helpless male. Your dreams may range from relatively conventional spanking scenes to fantasies of keeping a male as a sex slave to torment, tease, and control. But have you ever gone forth to find a submissive male? Why not? Here are some possible reasons. 1. You can't respect a man who wants to be dominated. 2. You don't believe any men actually want to be dominated. 3. You're afraid the real experience won't measure up to your fantasies. 4. You're afraid that you would, or could, seriously hurt the submissive male. 5. You don't believe it's morally right for women to dominate men. 6. Your man, past or current, tried it and hated it. There's no point in trying again. I shall deal with these problems one by one in numbered order. 1. 
You can't respect a man who wants to be dominated. Somewhere inside, you secretly cherish the image of the macho male so celebrated by our patriarchal culture. I could simply dismiss this as an individual aberration. If you haven't noticed that Rambo is a homicidal maniac and an asshole to boot, you're hopeless. Except this widespread attitude must be demolished. Otherwise, strong and healthy women may find themselves wan wondering uneasily if their submissive males aren't, well, a little unmanly. Nothing could be further from the truth. First, let's take a look at the Rambo model of masculinity. I could evince a dozen other actors who have made this disgusting creature their specialty, but why advertise them? His best points are physical strength and a willingness to defend his family or his honor, usually the latter. His worst points are a deranged predilection for violence, unveiled hatred and contempt for women, unwillingness to listen to reason, and total emotional isolation, except for an occasional female bedmate who is killed off by the end of the film. And his male buddy, and God knows they scarcely share much real feeling unless committing mass murder together can be called a sharing experience. He doesn't think, read, feel, or tuck. He kills. His only emotion is rage. And all too often that rage is turned against women, who in these films are always either pure, good, passive females, almost invariably victims, or slaughterous bitches. Is that real manliness? Do you want your sons growing up to behave like that? A submissive male, on the other hand, serves, honors, and respects women. He can feel. The whole point of the fantasy is often to provide an outlet for emotions that our society has defined as forbidden to men. His deep emotional connection to his mistress enables them to share the fantasy. But is he strong? Absolutely. He would lay down his life for his mistress, and he's likely, statistically speaking, to be a high-earning professional, an intellectual, a powerful man with a responsible job, a man who needs the release of letting someone else decide and choose for once, a man who understands that his feminine side, crushed by the ceaseless demands of his work, must find some expression in his life. The modern ideal of manhood is based on the machine. No, not just any machine, a machine gun. The submissive male's ideal of manhood is the medieval ideal. A man sworn to serve and protect an all-powerful lady, he is proud to wear her favor, to show the world the woman to whom he owes allegiance, love, and service. Though he can fight, he can also love. He is not ashamed of his emotions or his spirituality. He is both a poet and a knight, a complete human being, and he longs with all his heart to serve his mistress. Which man is worth more of your respect? Two, you don't believe any men actually want to be dominated. <laughs> Just look in the classifieds of any alternative newspaper. They're begging for it. A man may be too shy to tell you his fantasies on the first date, but as you suggest it, you'll see how fast he'll jump at the chance. Number three, you're afraid the real experience won't measure up to your fantasies. Possibly it won't at first. Developing a shared fantasy takes time and trust. Follow the detailed instructions given in subsequent chapters and you'll both have a healthy relationship and a satisfying role as mistress. After you've grown used to actually commanding a male, the mere fantasy rule will forever seem flat and pallid to you. Four, you're afraid that you could or would seriously hurt your submissive male. These are really, there are really two issues here. Could you hurt him? And would you hurt him? Could you hurt him? It is possible. But given detailed instructions, for example, the ones in this book, and a reasonable amount of care, serious harm is exceedingly unlikely. Even a severe spanking won't kill him. <laughs> but you may have a deep hidden fear of the harm a girl can do to a boy. Did your parents ever warn you against harming men? Try to bring these issues to the surface and deal with them before you set up your first scene. Would you hurt him? That's another question entirely. Look inside of yourself. If you do wish to hurt a man, please see a therapist and get rid of your rage before you try to act out your fantasies. I'm not answerable for the consequences if you don't listen to this warning. Five, you don't believe it's morally right for women to dominate men. 
your moral beliefs are between you and God. But if you are open to argument, please read this section of this chapter entitled A Defense of Female Domination. Number six, your man, Pastor Current, tried it and hated it. There's no point in trying again. <laughs> yes, there is, especially if the man who hated it is no longer your partner. If your current man tried and disliked the experience, try talking with him about it. What was the problem? Was he uncomfortable with the intensity of his emotions? Did it evoke childhood feelings of helplessness or pain? Did he feel rushed in too deep a servitude? Did he feel uncomfortable using the safe word? Was there a specific act that bothered him? Would something else work better? If discussions go nowhere, he won't talk or won't say more than that he hated it. Maybe you do have to choose between acting out your fantasies or staying with your current partner. But more often you'll find that he liked it, but it went on too long, or something you said reminded him of his mother, which is a sure passion killer, or he simply felt silly wearing high heels and would have preferred to be tied up. With time, a guilty dominatrix can relax and enjoy her enjoy enacting her most secret fantasies. You already possess the most important quality needed for a mistress, the willingness to rule. Once you actually take charge, you and the submissive males in your life will have a wonderful time. The unwilling dominatrix. The truly unwilling dominatrix has no fantasies of controlling males. She may just be uninterested in playing games with the balance of power in her relationships. She herself may be a submissive, or she may be revolted by the idea of hurting someone. These three types, the bored, the submissive, and the terrified, all deserve individual consideration. The bored. If you are not interested in female domination, and several attempts have failed to arouse any spark of desire, try reading the rest of this book. You may simply never have found the right scenario. If nothing here appeals to you, it's probably safe to say that you are not and will never be a mistress. No matter how fascinating others find the subject, you cannot be talked into female domination. Try another fantasy. You can be a sexually powerful, loving, strong woman without doing femdom. The submissive. If you are a submissive yourself, you understand the joys of being dominated, punished, and consoled. Consequently, you may feel that the place over the knee is rightfully and delightfully yours. However, some of the best doms I know started out as submissives who widened their repertoire. Best of all, you don't have to give up the joys of submission in order to enjoy dominance. As a switch, you automatically double your chances for a date at any play party, and you get the best of both worlds. It's worth trying the dominant role a few times to see if you enjoy it. You may prefer to have different partners for each role. One person to dom you, another to sub you, or you may enjoy switching with your primary partner. If you yourself cannot do it, but the idea intrigues you, make up a wicked sister and step into her dominant personality. Use your imagination to create a world in which you are the cruel mistress and your partner is infinitely punishable bad boy or a sissy maid or whatever his specific fantasy is. If he is at all fair, and he should be, your mate will reciprocate with an evening of whatever kinky activities you crave. Of course, you may find that you are a hardwired submissive with no dominant tendencies, but at least you tried. The Terrified If you are terrified or revolted at the thought of female domination, you may be facing one of two problems. Maybe both. Perhaps you believe that any dominance play is sick that it leads to the devaluation of women, or to real rape, mayhem, and murder, and that anyone who tries it is well on their way to becoming America's next serial killer. Or you may hold more tolerant opinions of dominance play in general, but the idea of your taking part deeply distresses you. These two attitudes might be called the political and the personal. Political terror. Dominance play can be a difficult problem for a committed feminist. As a committed feminist myself, I should know. I refuse to toss around sneering terms like political correctness. I respect your stand, though I disagree with it. But I would like to point out that power is ineradicable in people's lives, and that playing conscious games with it is far healthier than allowing it to remain potent and un unexamined, causing problems behind the scenes. Aside from the usefulness of women trying on the role of tyrant, all consensual dominance play teaches the shared symbiotic use of power. Consent works both ways. Just n as not all intercourse is rape, not all power games are evil manipulations. Your objection could be more psychological. 
you may reject dominance play because you're disgusted and frightened by the horrors of non-consensual sadomasochism. You are right to fear the psychotic few. But the link between consensual fantasy and violent crime doesn't hold. People who engage in dominance play or even in dominance fantasy rarely commit sex crimes. Most of them refuse to even hit their children and act strongly endorsed by traditional culture. The two types of dominance are totally different, not just in degree, but in kind. I like to drive fast, but I'm no carjacker. I break the driving laws when I go over 65 miles per hour, and so does a carjacker when he steals a Mercedes at gunpoint, but I don't think the two acts are comparable, or that driving too fast in my elderly station wagon will make me steal somebody's sports car. Or to put it in other terms, somebody who enjoys a rare steak isn't necessarily a cannibal. Does consensual dominance play lead to harder stuff? Shades of reefer madness? No. In fact, if Jung is to be trusted, people who are aware and accepting of their forbidden desires, aka the shadow, are far less likely to have them erupt in a way that could devastate themselves and everyone around them. Anyone mentally healthy and aware enough to deal with dominance fantasies in a consensual relationship is exceedingly unlikely to go into non-consensual activities. There is a further logic problem to assuming that dominance games lead to dreadful results. Don't fall into the trap of Kraft Ebbing, the Victorian psychologist who wrote the seminal work on sexual deviance, Psychopathia Sexualis. His case histories, which ranged from necrophiliacs to a man who had sex with a chicken, all gleefully note that, without exception, these perverts had been known to masturbate. Therefore, masturbation caused their sick behavior. Unfortunately for the good doctor, almost everybody else masturbates too, and few of us have been known to ravish domestic fowl, much less dig up graves. That's like saying that breathing air causes death because all people who die have breathed it. Personal Terror if you're seriously distressed at the thought of female domination, you may be dealing with deeper issues than who gets tied up tonight. I will gently explore these issues, and then, as always, I will recommend that you discuss them with a competent therapist. Perhaps that sounds comic, but I mean it seriously. If you are absolutely psychologically unable to take charge sexually, whether during intercourse or only in fantasy play, you have unnecessarily limited your range of expression. A therapist can help you find out why and help you to free yourself from your fears and inhibitions. The intense distress you feel at being asked to dominate a man may even be cognitive dissonance, the clash of conflicting identities. Reared to be passive and accommodating to males, you're faced with an impossible situation. To accommodate the man you love, you must cease to be passive. This is a classic double bind. You cannot with any comfort or peace choose either alternative. Consequently, you're miserable. When you realize that he's miserable too, you may feel even worse. How can you make a fuss over such a small thing? It is not a small thing, I assure you. The ordinary sex stereotyping of our society is destructive enough. It makes women who are strong or fat or smart or otherwise different feel like filthy, unlovable monsters, crimes against nature. I will say that the female dominance culture is generally very accepting of such departures from the weak, thin, dumb, blonde, who is apparently the bell ideal of all culture. Adding female dominance to the list may make you feel like a total freak. Worse yet, you may have suffered additional experiences that sensitized you to the problem. For example, if you were reared with a violent father as I was, ordering a man to do your bidding may be completely beyond you. You've learned to lie low, lest your abusive father destroy you. Any attempt to repress your feelings and force your way through the situation may result in serious psychological harm. Yes, at some point you must confront your terror and realize that you're taking command. Even in play will not result in your instant destruction, but I beg that you will do so only in the care of a qualified counselor. This took me years of therapy, but the pain was well worth it because I was able to reclaim my power, not just in the sexual arena, but in all the other areas of life where I had been hiding from my own strength. Some women reared in such dreadful family situations may not be passive, but may espouse egalitarianism with a zeal that makes female dominance or any dominance psychologically impossible. 
If you're one of them, you will not serve, but you will not rule either. Power belongs to the cruel parent. With a fierce pride, you refuse to touch it. Your own carefully built self-image would shatter if you did, for you would be forced to see that you are like the monster who made your early life a misery. Neither of these attitudes is especially healthy, though God knows they're understandable. Power in itself is not evil, and the playful exchange of power between consenting adults is a far cry from the thuggish brutality of an abusive adult terrorizing a helpless child. With professional help, you can reclaim the strength in yourself that your mate sees and desires and learn to exercise the rule you were born for.